Okay, so uh, finally, not really finally, but you know, the, the rest of the First Amendment, centering in particular on freedom of speech, freedom of expression, okay, we talked about the First Amendment, freedom of religion, what that's all about. Again, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, all of these things, uh, kind of ultimately for the sake of allowing citizens to hear different points of views, come to the truth on their own. Again, remember that idea that Jefferson says, truth is sufficient, can stand on our own. It's only error that needs the support of government. So underlying this, it's not really freedom of speech or freedom of, of expression for its own sake, as if it's mysteriously, it's just good to say things that are false. Um, and for some reason, just as long as you can say whatever you want to, that's what matters. The notion is this really, the more freedom of speech and freedom of expression you have, the more that people are free to really explore different ideas, hear them debated and so on, the more likely they are to arrive at the truth. The more that you have the government trying to suppress or discourage certain forms of, of speech or expression, the more likely you are to have government promoting error rather than truth, okay? So freedom of expression, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, all of these things, again, originally, ultimately, for the goal of allowing people to hear different points of view, arrive at the truth for their own, for themselves. Okay, again, the goal is truth. The expectation is that this is the best way to get people there. Um, uh, and now we'll look at the different uh, ways that that has been interpreted. The other thing, of course, again, this is the First Amendment. We're talking about the government. We're talking about government restrictions on freedom of speech, okay? Um, private employers are very different, right? If you work for the Coca-Cola company and you tweet out the recipe for Coke, you will probably lose your job and you'll probably be sued. Okay, if you work for, you know, Boeing or McDonnell Douglas or something and you tweet out uh, important defense details that are, that are classified, you'll probably lose your job, you may well be sued, and you may well be prosecuted for espionage or possibly even treason or something, okay? Obviously, your employer can put all kinds of restrictions on what you can say, uh, especially about, uh, about, especially about, you know, what you know as you know, trade secrets or whatever, but also in other ways, they may say, you know, anything that you say publicly that ends up embarrassing or damaging the company could be grounds for dismissal. And of course, that's gonna be much more likely the more public your job is, right? Um, the other point, of course, the government, these are not private corporations, uh, social media companies. There's been a lot of debate about that recently, of course, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, whatever, and when they ban people from their, uh, from their services and so on, that's not a first amendment issue. Okay. The first amendment is just about the government, private corporations like Facebook or Twitter can, can have whatever terms of service they want. And they can also refuse to do business with whoever they want. They can kick whatever accounts they want off of their, uh, off of their uh, server. It's not a First Amendment issue. It's not a constitutional issue. Um, obviously, it may not be good, right? You could argue that, that these things need to be regulated, that this should be different. That's all fine. It's just it's not a question of the First Amendment and uh, the Constitution. Lots of things are legal but bad, and lots of things could be changed. And you can see lots of ways in which uh, laws and, and policy and so on might change to do different things and to have different goals and that would be good and it's not really a constitutional question. Okay, so again, remember this is just about the government, not about private companies, um, but you know, that doesn't mean that, that those, that, that freedom of speech may not, if you have a more expansive version, it may not be important to take some of these things into consideration, but when we're talking about the First Amendment, uh, and those specific constitutional legal questions, we're not talking about private corporations and, and how they handle things. Um, okay, so again, like with freedom of religion, we have the debate, there's kind of different ways of understanding an absolute wall of separation versus a, a more kind of laid back or a little bit less uh, thoroughgoing uh, approach that just says, well, it just means that the government can't establish a religion. Uh, there's also an absolute freedom of expression versus and Holmes's view, okay, this is Oliver Wendell Holmes, who famously said, a man does not have a right to shout fire in a crowded theater, okay? If you're in a crowded theater and you shout fire and there is no fire and people panic and they run out and they trample each other, the notion is, you know, you, don't, you can't say that's free speech, okay? Uh, you can't do something that you know will have really damaging consequences and then say, well, but it was free speech, especially if it's a lie, right? Now, Holmes actually, relatively quickly came to regret that example and regret that ruling because it was actually just about a, an anti-war pamphlet. So the notion that you can't criticize a war when it's happening, uh, obviously a very restrictive notion of what free speech actually is and what the First Amendment is actually doing. 
to us today and for the past you know, 60 years or something, it's kind of shocking to think that somebody would, would compare criticizing an ongoing war uh, or criticizing the form of government, even in a really, even calling for its overthrow, the notion that that would be compared to uh, starting a, a stampede in a crowded theater for no reason, and that would be considered not protected by the First Amendment is, is somewhat shocking, okay? So that's a very restricted view of free speech and not the one that has prevailed over the past, again, 60 or 70 years, okay? Beginning in the 1950s, especially the 1960s, the Supreme Court starts consistently ruling in ways that expand the notion of what is protected by the First Amendment, okay? So we'll look at how that happens, what that means, okay? Freedom of expression, freedom of the press, um, again, as the press changes as the actual material, material physical means of distributing ideas change, some, some policy issues change, some constitutional things change, okay? So prior restraint is basically when the government tries to prevent something from being published before it's actually published, okay? This has been declared uh, unconstitutional. The government cannot try to stop something from being published. If it breaks a law, if it slanders somebody, if it reveals state secrets, then the government can deal with that afterwards, right? But the government cannot stop something from being published ahead of time. We might call this just censorship, right? Um, Supreme Court has said the government cannot do that. Whatever the justification is, the government cannot step in and stop something before it's published. It cannot stop something from being published ahead of time because it claims it will break the law. It can prosecute the, the author, the publisher, the whoever distributes it afterwards, but it can't stop things ahead of time, okay? Uh, another important freedom of speech uh, decision or freedom of press decision by the Supreme Court near the Minnesota, this was 1931. This was an early victory for uh, freedom of speech, freedom of the press. The Supreme Court ruled that a newspaper cannot be shut down because of what it's done in the past, even, again, even if it's broken the law, even if it has been successfully sued for slander. You cannot shut, the government cannot shut down a publication because they think that it's really bad or it's really irresponsible. Even if they keep doing things that are highly questionable, even if they publish kind of what seem like irresponsible attacks on political leaders, Government can't come in and shut them down and say, basically, that's enough from you, okay? Um, individuals certainly can sue and can make it, can basically drive a, a, a publication out of business by, by suing and if they win and, and getting such a, such a significant uh, um, award of damages that it bankrupts the, uh, the publication for, for libel or something like that. But the government cannot shut down a publication because of what is published in the past, again, even if they've done things that are, that are uh, questionable. Again, you can prosecute them if they broke the law, but you can't go and say you've done this too many times, we're, we're closing you down now, okay? Um, free speech and public order, this is one of the, the, the great uh, debates, right? The great tensions, how much do you allow people to say whatever uh, versus public order, national security, okay? So in the late 1960s, there was a case involving the Pentagon Papers, okay? These were documents that were stolen from the Pentagon by someone named Daniel Ellsberg, and it, they showed, they were evidence from the Pentagon, from private meetings, showing that both the military and the civilian leadership uh, during the Vietnam War knew that the Vietnam War was not going well. They knew that they were publicly, they were saying that they had objectives, that they were meeting, that the war was succeeding, that it was you know, a good thing. And privately, they knew that it wasn't happening. And they made the decision to keep lying to the public because they were afraid of losing support for obvious reasons, okay? So when that came out, um, the uh, Nixon administration threatened to prosecute Ellsberg and the New York Times, who was going to publish it. The Nixon administration threatened to, to uh, prosecute them for treason and tried to stop that from being published. Again, it went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said the government can't do that. Even if you're claiming national security, even if you're claiming treason, you can absolutely prosecute people for treason after it's been published that you cannot step in and stop something from being published because you claim it will do these things, because you claim it will break these laws. Again, even if you're claiming it's national security, it's treason, okay? Government cannot stop that from being published. In the event, the Nixon administration did not prosecute anybody for the publication of the Pentagon Papers, okay? So it was also, and this is kind of part of the rationale, right? You can't just threaten, you can't just claim that something is national security or that something is going to be treason, um, and use that as a way to stop something from being published. If it is, you can prosecute them afterwards. 
But of course, without doing that, just stopping it from being published, we'll never know, right? We'll never know what it was and we'll never know whether it actually was, whether it actually was damaging to national security or whether publishing it was an act of treason. Again, in this very important case, it was not, or at least the people who threatened that it was and said that they were gonna prosecute it never did, decided that it wasn't, okay? So Schenck v. United States, 1919, this is a conviction of an anti-war pamphleteer, okay? Gitlow v. New York, we talked about this with the incorporation doctrine. It became the basis for the incorporation doctrine. That's when the Supreme Court first said that the 14th Amendment means that the Federal Bill of Rights applies to the states. The 14th Amendment means that individuals, American citizens, have rights as citizens of the national or the federal government that no state can interfere with. But in Gitlow v. New York, they upheld Benjamin Gitlow's uh, conviction for uh, publishing revolutionary pamphlets uh, and distributing them, okay? So uh, these original 1910s, 1920s, not, not much respect for freedom of speech, okay? They're convicting anti-war pamphleteers, they're convicting socialists who are saying that the American system will be overthrown, needs to be overthrown. They're, all kinds of things are considered, you know, not protected by the First Amendment, and when people are being prosecuted and jailed for publishing or distributing them, the Supreme Court is upholding those convictions, okay? This changes over time. It, so we can already see the Pentagon Papers. Again, this is the late 60s. Another important free speech decision, uh, Brandenburg v. Ohio, 1969. A lot of these things are overturned. Things like Gitlow and Shank, these very restrictive, much more limited conceptions of free speech and the notion that uh, free speech does not justify things that could be interpreted as threatening public order. A lot of that gets tossed out by, by Brandenburg v. Ohio, v. Ohio okay? Um, Brandenburg says that speech can be prohibited only under two, there's kind of a two-pronged uh, test here. Speech can be prohibited only if it, one, is directed at inciting or producing eminent lawless action, and two, is likely to incite or produce such action. So advocating violent revolution in the abstract is constitutionally protected, okay? inciting, incitement is kind of the, the, the key word here, okay? If speech is directed at inciting or producing some sort of imminent lawless action, if it's actually go burn down that building, go attack that person, go smash that thing, go kill this, whatever, okay? If, if you're actually directing, if you're inciting somebody to try to, predict, to, to uh, uh, engage in or to uh, carry out some sort of, and again, the, the idea eminent. It can't just be somebody should do this at some point in the future. If you're actually inciting people right in front of you to go do something, or if you publish something, it's a little bit harder to do with publishing for obvious reasons. But if you publish something and you're trying to incite somebody to do something immediate, then maybe it's something that could be prohibited or could be, or, you know, you could be prosecuted for after the fact. But it needs to be directed at inciting or producing those actions, okay? And again, it has to be considered likely to incite or produce that action, okay? So now it's a very different view. You can advocate for all sorts of dramatic, violent, terrible, revolutionary, whatever, you know, all kinds of different things. Some may be somewhat good, some may be bad, some may be who knows, um, but you can advocate for those things in principle, as long as you're not inciting to a particular eminent lawless act, okay? So Brandenburg, Brandenburg v. Ohio, 1969, gives a much more expansive notion of free speech and what sorts of things are protected by the First Amendment, even if they are calling for things that would be illegal and maybe even violent and maybe even revolutionary and destructive on a very wide scale. As long as you're talking about it in the abstract, it's constitutionally protected, okay, after this decision, okay? Free, free speech versus fair trials, there's always this tension Again, we wanna have open public trials. How are people gonna know what's happening in the courtrooms? You need to be able to report. On the other hand, if the jurors can, can hear a testimony in court and then go home that night and watch on television or wake up the next morning and read a newspaper and hear somebody tearing the witness to shreds and saying this person was obviously not credible for all these reasons, how are you gonna get a, a fair trial? Uh, so the, there, there's some tension there. Do you allow the court maximum uh, or do you allow the press maximum access to a trial and to the courtroom? Or do you try to protect the, the fairness of the trial by making sure that nobody understands that there's no outside influence on the jurors in particular? And the way that they usually do that in the cases where there may be a high profile trial 
and you're worried about something like that happening with the jurors, they will uh, sequester the jurors where they will you know, live in a hotel during the time of the trial, can't really have outside access to media or things like that. They can visit with family, but they can't discuss the case. So the, you know, the, on the one hand, so basically between the, these two principles, a fair trial and a free press and letting the public know what's actually happening during the trial as it's happening, um, neither one really wants to be compromised. So you end up saying, okay, well, we'll just isolate the jurors instead, okay? Uh, obscenity is not constitutionally protected, but it's hard to define, okay? There's a famous phrase from, uh, I, was, I think it was the early 70s, the Supreme Court case dealing with this, one of the justices said, what is obscenity? I can't define it, but I know it when I see it. Uh, so I can kind of tell when something is just obscene, when it's just meant to be uh, titillating and uh, things like that, rather than having some sort of more artistic purpose or obviously a scientific purpose, okay? So obscenity is not constitutionally protected. It's hard to define. Generally, there's a deference to community standards, okay? Something that may be considered obscene in Duncan, Oklahoma, may not be considered obscene in Lawton, much less in you know, New York or, or San Francisco or wherever. So there's some deference to community standards, but for something to be considered obscene and therefore not protected by the First Amendment, it needs to be lacking in serious artistic or scientific or other significant cultural values, okay? And these are defined by national standards. So if there's a, a, a famous painting or a statue of a naked person and a, a particular community finds that obscene and wants to ban reproductions of it in, in textbooks or whatever, uh, that will be constitutionally protected because those national standards say it has artistic merit, okay? But other things, obscenity, things that are, you know, um, you know obscene, uh, not constitutionally protected, hard to define really, and so usually the deference is for community standards, okay? Um, so that is one type of speech that is not constitutionally protected, obscenity, even though it's sometimes hard to tell if something is technically obscene or if it would actually be protected speech. Okay, libel and slander to other forms of speech that are obviously not uh, constitutionally protected. These are things that are false or malicious statements that will damage somebody's reputation, okay? If it's published, it's libel, if it's speech, it's slander. And again, these are things that are not true, or they might be true, but they're very malicious. And they're stated, they're, they're spread about, whether through speech or through publication, to damage somebody's reputation, okay? Um, now, it used to be somewhat easier to, uh, to sue for, for libel or slander, okay? Another important Supreme Court case, New York Times v. Sullivan. Again, this is sort of the 1960s. Uh, the, the Supreme Court there ruled that uh, in the case of public figures, Okay, uh, a, comment, a statement can be libelous only if it's made with malice and with reckless disregard of the truth. Okay, so honest factual errors, or, you know, things that are not, that, that don't, uh, that aren't either made with malice, and it's kind of hard to know what someone's intention would be. Legally, intention is always a very difficult thing to figure out unless somebody says, my intention is. But, you know, when people are publishing certain things, they usually don't say, my intention here is to be, is to be malicious. Then reckless disregard of the truth. Again, very hard to say, why is that reckless disregard of the truth, okay? Uh, so the basic idea there is with public figures, okay? Not necessarily private individuals, but public figures. You want it to be relatively easy to question, to criticize, to talk about them, and not to worry about being sued for libel, okay? In this particular case, Sullivan, he was a, uh, he was the head of the state police in, in a southern state. Uh, and there had been a, a statement issued, published not by the New York Times itself, but it was published in the New York Times. It was, a, I think, an advertisement that was taken out by a group of civil rights leaders criticizing the way that a nonviolent protest had been handled. And it didn't even mention Sullivan. And Sullivan sued them. And they, the New York Times was sort of, he sort of demanded that they take it down. And the New York Times was sort of confused. Or, you know, they didn't take it down because they didn't have the internet, obviously, in 1963 or whatever it was. Um, so, you know, demand though that they repudiated or that they rescinded or something. Uh, and the New York Times at first was a little bit confused because they said, you know, you're not even mentioned. This, you're saying that this hurts your reputation. It's unclear. You're not even mentioned. So it's a little bit unclear uh, why you would think that this is somehow damaging your reputation. So here it is sort of the, the confrontation in meme form. Um, and then, but he pressed ahead and sued. And that's where the Supreme Court said, because there were some minor factual errors about particular things. 
And that's when the Supreme Court gave this, again, somewhat more expansive notion of what kind of speech is protected. If you're talking about a public figure, what if you say something that isn't necessarily true? Public figures, you want more robust debate is basically the idea. Now, the, obviously the downside is that people say all kinds of things that are not true and it's very difficult to sue, okay? It's very difficult to, to, to deal with it in certain ways. Um, but the basic idea is, again, public figures, not private individuals, you can only, it's only considered libel or slander if it's made with reckless disregard for the truth and with malice. And so very hard actually for public figures to successfully sue in the United States. Other countries somewhat different, but hard for them to sue successfully in the United States, okay? Other forms of speech, symbolic speech, that's nonverbal communication, okay? For instance, wearing an armband, the Supreme Court case that established that symbolic speech is constitutionally protected by the First Amendment dealt with high school students wearing armbands, again, in the 1960s, the same kind of era here, uh, to protest the Vietnam War. Um, so they were suspended, they, they sued and said, you know, this is freedom of speech. And the response was, you're not saying anything. It went to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court said, Yes, wearing an armband is a symbolic act. You're communicating something. You're using symbols or maybe actions or something rather than words, but you're still communicating something. And it's, it's still protected by the First Amendment, okay? Flag burning, burning the American flag, a very emotional thing for a lot of people. A lot of people think it should be illegal. It's been upheld by the Supreme Court as constitutionally protected because again, the notion is it is symbolic speech. You're communicating an idea. You're not using words, but you're still communicating something. Therefore, it's protected by the First Amendment, okay? Commercial speech, by contrast, much easier to regulate or to restrict for obvious reasons. The purpose of commercial speech is to sell something. It's not to debate the truth. It's not to create better government or better policy or something. It's to sell something. So obviously if you're lying about what your product does, that's illegal, okay? That's much easier to deal with because the same constitutional and the same kind of philosophical and principled reasons why you want more debate in other areas don't apply to commercial speech, okay? Public airwaves become a little bit less relevant every year, these, these major networks, but they are heavily regulated because there are a limited number of broadcast frequencies and having access or control to one of those like CBS or NBC is considered something of a public trust, okay? So those, those major free networks are much more heavily regulated than newspapers or, or print, right? You can basically print anything you want to at this point. Um, and they're more heavily uh, regulated than basic cable and basic cable is more heavily reg regulated than sort of premium cable, okay? Um, and again, much of this is the notion it's a public trust. Uh, there are only so many of these, so the government can regulate them. Again, same with radio, right? Government can regulate them somewhat more uh, energetically. Okay, finally, freedom of assembly, right? So you've said these things. Maybe you don't like something that the government is doing. Maybe you want to go out and protest, let, let you know, call attention, let other people know what's going on, let the government see that you're unhappy, okay? Um, go out and meet with other people for whatever. So you have the right to assembly and protest, but the key idea or the key point here is limits of time, place, and manner, okay? So you cannot protest wherever you want to, whenever you want to, in whatever manner you want to. There are limits of time, okay? Uh, you can't necessarily go in a residential neighborhood and have a giant, really loud rally at three o'clock in the morning. Place, residential neighborhoods generally may not be appropriate places for protests. And manner, again, are you blocking traffic? Are you setting off explosives? Um, you know, maybe not damaging anything, but still, it may not be an appropriate way to, to have this thing, okay? So freedom of assembly, you have the right to assemble. There are limits of time, place, and manner, okay? So again, the freedom of uh, assembly is not absolute. Um, and then freedom of assembly in the First Amendment has also been interpreted and extended to include freedom of association, okay? Including association for political purposes. So the government cannot ban particular political parties or political associations. And you cannot be uh, you know, arrested or put on trial or you know, in one way or another targeted by the government uh, for your, for your uh, participation or your political association with a given group, a party, an organization, whatever it is, okay? So those are the overall details then of freedom of speech, freedom of the press, and then finally freedom of assembly here in the First Amendment.